So while um, people are joining us, I wanted to welcome you to the first lecture of the annual lecture series at the Center for Philosophy of Science this uh, uh, spring semester of 2021. Before introducing our uh, speaker today, let me remind you of the events at the center. Next week, we have three lectures, one on Tuesday at noon by Erika Schumanner, one on Friday at noon by Kevin Dost, and the Senior Visiting Fellow Seminar Cosmology Beyond Space Time is taking place at 10.15 a.m. Christopher Smink from Western is going to be uh, giving a lecture in this uh, seminar. If you're interested in any of these events, as usual, please go to the website of the center, look for the center's calendar, and then you'll find all the information for uh, joining in and registering for any of these events. Um, today, as I said, it's the first lecture of the annual lecture series this uh, spring, and we are uh, honored, uh, I think that's true, and, and really delighted to uh, be able to uh, host, even so it's online, uh, uh, John uh, Ioannidis. Um, I, I checked beforehand and I hope I, it was an approximation good enough pronunciation of John's name. Uh, John really needs no uh, uh, in introduction these days, but I will nonetheless do my duty as host of this event. So John is C.F. Renborg Ren Chair in Disease Prevention, Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford University. He has also appointment in Biomedical Data Science in Statistics. He's a co-director of the uh, Meta Research Innovation Stand uh, Center at Stanford. John has done uh, a, a, an extremely uh, rich body of, put together an extremely rich body, body of work on meta science, on how science uh, works, starting now 20 or 25 years ago. He is the author of some of the most important papers in this uh, research uh, tradition. And I found out on look, uh, by looking at his website that his maybe most famous paper, why most published research findings are false, published in 2005, if memory help in uh, uh, PLOS uh, medicine, is the most accessed article in the history of public library of science, which is really quite a remarkable achievement, an extremely important article. John has published an, an extremely large number of articles and including book in, in, in Greeks, and he has received many Awards, including interestingly the Einstein Fellow in uh, uh, Fellow in, in 2018, is a member of numerous academy, including the National Academy of uh, Science, extremely cited uh, for his research in meta science. He's been involved, uh, uh, as most of you probably know, uh, in the debate about uh, COVID, about what to do about it, about how dangerous uh, COVID is over the last year. And, and a half. And I wanted to uh, conclude this very brief introduction with a few quotations from his website, because uh, John actually did end up his website with a very philosophical note, uh, almost a Socratic note. Um, and here is what John says at the website, uh, on his website, I consider myself privileged to have learned and to continue to learn from interaction with students and young scientists of all ages from all over the world. And I love to be constantly reminded that I know next to nothing. So if you know, of course, Socratic, Socrates Maxim, know thyself and I, I know nothing and all this kind of thing, it's actually a remarkable way for a scientist to conclude his uh, short bio sketch. Um, so we're really honored and delighted to uh, hear uh, John tell us about his research uh, today. John, uh, without further ado, I don't want to, make, to take too much of your uh, time, uh, and I'm more interested in hearing uh, from you. So the, the screen is, is yours. Thank you. Th thank you for the very kind invitation and the, the, the generous introduction. Um, it's, it's a great honor to, uh, to talk to people in your center. I hope that I could be in uh, Pittsburgh this time of the year and uh, be able to have some uh, philosophical discussions face to face in, in person. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that Zoom will, will try to, to help us to, uh, to talk about uh, different issues that uh, are very interesting at the interface of philosophy, science regarding reproducibility and utility of uh, research efforts. Let me try to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to discuss about reproducible and useful research and uh, the landscape of changing research practices. Uh, 
I, I think that uh, this is a theme that is relevant to philosophy of science. Uh, in a way, philosophy and science is setting the foundations of the research method and reproducibility, replication are foundational issues in the scientific uh, method. However, besides theory, there's empirical data. And I think that one distinctive feature for the last several decades is that we can approach and attack many questions that are pertinent to philosophical issues in, in science and the scientific method with empirical data. We have an amazing amount of research papers, publications, books, and other written products published over the years. We have about 200 million pieces of scholarly work that have been published. And this is a snapshot of recent scholarly works, recent publications that have been published across science. It looks like a universe with multiple galaxies. As you can see, this is a, a map that I have uh, drawn with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Kevin Boyack, and we're working on mapping of science. The different colors correspond to different disciplines like medicine and chemistry. Each one of these tiny dots is a discipline, a scientific discipline. And I'm pointing here with an arrow, my best paper, or what I think is my best paper. It's a speck of dust in a speck of dust in a speck of dust somewhere around here. It, what I think is fascinating is the ability to look at these bird's eye views of the scientific landscape and try to learn about how that universe has been generated, how it has evolved, how it is expanding, how much reliable it is, and how useful eventually it is. Science is the best thing that has happened to humans, I think, but it's very easy to get it wrong. So the question is, can we get it more efficient? Can we get it better? Can we get it to become also more useful when it comes to applied science as opposed to just uh, blue sky curiosity science. This is not an easy task and it, it varies from one field to another. There's differences across different scientific fields that go beyond theory. They're embedded in the mission, in the targets, in the outlooks of what different fields are trying to achieve. The degree of determinism that is considered to be good enough or not enough varies quite a bit across different scientific fields. The signal to measurement error ratio varies a lot. And I'm not trying to prioritize fields in terms of some being better or worse than others. Is a field that has a high error uh, signal um, worse? I'm not sure. Maybe actually it's better. Maybe it means that it's struggling under more adverse odds to come up with discovering the real signals and validating them. Complexity of designs and measurement tools. Some, some scientific questions and research fields are using very straightforward tools. Others are using very complex tools of measurement, very complex designs, and they have their own caveats and strengths, of course. The closeness of fit between the hypothesis and the experimental design and data. This can vary also substantially. The statistical and analytic methods that are used to test hypotheses or even whether hypotheses are being tested versus some other sort of description or exploration or uh, interpolation of uh, data and theory uh, is uh, being performed. What is the typical heterogeneity of experimental results that people will say this is too much uh, versus uh, homogeneity uh, results that uh, can be replicated with multiple studies uh, giving exactly the same signal in terms of location and magnitude? whether there's even a culture of replication, transparency, and accumulating knowledge. Some fields uh, think that replication is a me-too exercise that needs to be avoided, and some others uh, would say that replication is a sine qua non, that uh, I'm not going to publish a paper unless I have replicated a specific finding multiple times. What are the statistical criteria for truth claims? For fields that are heavily using statistics, <coughs> they may set some ground rules of uh, what is a uh, a good enough threshold, uh, for example, typically fields using statistical significance, they may be setting thresholds at p-values less than 0 0.05. These might be different across different fields, both in terms of whether th thresholds are selected, what is the level of the threshold, and how is the inferential machinery is going to, use, to, to run. And finally, what are the purposes to which findings will be put and the consequences of the false conclusions? Is, is it blue sky science that has no... Uh, applications, at least the visible ones and immediate ones, 
or is it science and research that is trying to develop a specific product and have specific deliverables that need to be accomplished within a very short time frame? In the midst of all that variety of the scientific universe, uh, here comes meta-research. Meta-research is an engine for evaluating and improving research methods and practices. It's very close to philosophy of science in terms of thinking about the scientific method, but probably one distinct feature is that it, it uses heavy empirical data to try to gain insights about how things are being done how things are functioning or malfunctioning and how we could uh, per perhaps make our research methods and practices to be better, more efficient, more reliable. There's different components to that. There's the component of how to perform med uh, research. So this is about method, study design, method, statistics, research synthesis, collaboration and ethics. There's a component about how to communicate research or reporting standards, study registration, disclosing conflicts of interest or information to patients, to the public or to policymakers and many other stakeholders. A component of verifying research, the reproducibility criteria, sharing data, sharing methods, making them more transparent, repeatability, replicability, reproducibility, self-correction practices. Evaluating research in many different ways. Most of those uh, have been used uh, extensively without really having solid evidence that they really work. Pre-publication peer review, post-publication peer review, research funding criteria, or other means for evaluating scientific quality. And finally, once you evaluate research practices and uh, the research corpus, you also want to think about how to reward research and researchers, what kind of incentives you want to introduce and whether these incentives are making our life better or worse, whether they're improving science or creating some collateral damages. So promotion criteria, reward systems, penalties and research evaluation as they apply to individuals, to teams and to institutions. Obviously, each one of these frontiers has a different translation and a different transposability across different scientific fields and it may manifest in different ways. Here's a list of some related but distinct uh, disciplines. Uh, history and philosophy of science. I guess this is the, the reason that I'm here today uh, talking to you, uh, or epistemology, uh, the, uh, the, the science of, of science uh, in, in philosophy. Psychology and sociology of science, uh, statistics, data science, informatics, evidence-based medicine, or I would say evidence-based X, evidence-based public health, evidence-based genetics, evidence-based whatever in general. Research synthesis methods, for example, meta-analysis have uh, contributed the empirical ability to integrate information empirically across multiple studies, which is very useful for meta-research efforts. Journalology, the science of studying journals and their practices. Uh, Scientometrics and bibliometrics, measuring science or creating maps of science like the one that I showed you. Organizational and operations research, ethics, research integrity, accountability research communication sciences, policy research, and behavioral economics. This is just a partial list. I'm sure that there's many more that have an interface with meta-research or meta-science. And even for the name of that discipline, there's debate. I, I prefer the term meta-research. Some people prefer the term meta-science. There's some subtle differences which we could uh, discuss from a philosophical perspective uh, after the talk, if you wish. What is the typical research looking like? Uh, we can think of stereotypes, we can think of vignettes. Of course, uh, these probably do not represent any specific researcher and any specific research endeavor, but they can be helpful in thinking about why and how we do research and perhaps uh, what might go wrong in the way that we do research and therefore what we might do to try to improve efficiency, reproducibility and utility. Most research is done with limited resources. Unfortunately, even though science is so wonderful, uh, we have a hard time convincing people who have lots of money, uh, either taxpayers' money, governments, or other funders, to invest in research. I, I hope we could have more uh, funds invested uh, in science and, and in research, that science could have a more prominent uh, place uh, in uh, our community, in, in our society, and uh, we could have more scientists who are funded uh, to run large studies exactly as they want to run them. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Most scientists are struggling to get a little bit of funding 
unavoidably they have to work with small studies with limited resources. This means small sample size. They are solo silent investigators with small teams. They cannot recruit a large team to work with them. They need to show that they are successful because the way that the, most of these scientists are evaluated is that within a few years, they need to show convincingly that they have published, that they have found things, that they have discovered, that they have significant, nice looking results. They can make a claim that I'm saving the world or, or whatever, depending on the field that they are. This means that they're under pressure to show nice looking results. And that would lead to a lot of exploration, a lot of data dredging, a lot of cherry picking of the best looking hypothesis and the best looking results, sometimes in ways that are of questionable validity. For example, through p-hacking or through harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. A lot of that research is done post hoc without any pre-specified protocol, it is exploratory. The statistical criteria that are used are often very uh, lenient with a p-value of slightly less than 0.05. Uh, people are happy that this is statistically significant and this is translated as significant, which may not necessarily be the case in the vast majority of of cases, it's not the case. No registration, no data sharing, because this is something that would offer ammunition to competitors and that's to be avoided. And no replication, because again, this is something that uh, uh, will take time. And if you do replication studies, uh, you will probably not be able to find the original signal, which means that you have spent double the time, double the effort, double the resources, and then you're back to square zero, even though you have more credible evidence, and perhaps the evidence is just null, this is something that uh, is not really incentivized in that environment. When we are in that situation, we are in a situation of power failure. It, it means that we have small studies that are both unable to detect things that are real and are to be detected because we have low power, but worse, that at the same time low power means that when we do detect signals, they have a much higher chance of being completely false, false positives, or grossly exaggerated, much stronger than they really are. And you just need a very tiny bit of bias for that second situation to arise. And empirical studies suggest that not only that much, but far more bias is prominent in the vast majority of scientific fields. This is uh, just uh, one paper out of many that have been published uh, looking at different fields. This is uh, when we looked at neuroscience and we, we tried to see the footprint of power across uh, very different applications of neuroscience research, ranging from basic science all the way to clinical trials. The common denominator was that the power of the studies was very limited to detect even modestly large effects. The average power was 20% under optimistic calculations, was 8% under probably more realistic calculations. We've seen that in many other fields. This is uh, another empirical evaluation that I did with uh, Dennis Sooks uh, that we published in Pulse Biology four years ago, looking at neuroscience, psychology, and medical journals. And again, uh, looking at the effect sizes and the, the size of the studies and the power that we inferred that these studies would have to detect modest effects. They had very limited power to detect relatively large effects. They had a bit more, but even that was uh, in the underpowered range. Same thing in economics. Uh, the, these are empirical data that uh, we published along with uh, Tom Stanley and uh, Christo Kuliagos uh, in uh, uh, economics, uh, looking at 130 economics topics with more than 10,000 studies and more than 70,000 effect estimates, uh, looking at the percent of studies that had adequate power. Almost all the studies had low power and uh, there were few exceptions that uh, uh, power was, uh, was decent, but the vast majority of observational economics uh, suffered from similar problems as neuroscience. So it's, it's not just one field, it's something that is pervasive across multiple fields. There's the opposite situation. Uh, and again, this is a stereotype. I don't have any particular single study in mind, but it's something that is becoming also pretty common. It's probably not as common as the stereotype of uh, small data, uh, big data nevertheless are becoming a very prominent force in several areas in biomedicine, in physics and some other fronts. Here, the, the key characteristic is that we have extremely large sample sizes. This means that we have overpowered studies, almost everything that is tested for an association will come up with some signal that may have also some 
level of statistical significance that at least in the framework of uh, how people had operated with uh, small uh, size studies, they would claim that it is statistically significant and then generalize that it is also significant. While again, that leap of faith may not be warranted. There's still a lot of cherry picking. There's still a lot of uh, bee hacking. There's still a lot of uh, harking. There's still a lot of effort to detect signals that are more worthy than others. The, the problem here is that there's just too many signals in, uh, in contrast to the small studies that often give no signal and people are just iteratively trying to optimize the signal and make sure that they can say something at the end of the day. Here, the problem is that there's just too many signals and then you still have to pick which ones to build a narrative around. Much of that research is done post hoc. It's done with databases that sometimes they're accumulated without re the researchers pre-specifying what they want to collect. You have electronic uh, health records that are accumulating while I, I'm sleeping. And you know tomorrow morning, uh, there will be another 10,000 patients worth of observations with uh, 300 variables for each one of them. I have done nothing to collect them. They just collected themselves. Some administrator, some physicians entered them while I was sleeping. And perhaps I never thought that I would use them for research, but now I'm thinking of using them for research. I am attacking that database and I can yield uh, whatever I want out of it. Statistics tend to be more fancy in that world, uh, but usually statistical inference tools are idiosyncratic. They apply in different domains and they're different across different domains. There's not necessarily consensus on how exactly data ought to be analyzed or what is the best inferential tools. People tend to be more savvy if they work with this type of data, not necessarily so. And again, I'm using a stereotype. They may come up with more fancy statistical methods with more complex methods this means that these are methods that also have more degrees of freedom. No registration. Most of that research is not done with pre-specification. It just arises at an opportunity of, that uh, may come handy. And probably more data sharing compared to the small data world. These data often can be shared with many investigators. Often you may have lots of people who may take a look at them. Uh, the exact numbers can vary from application to application. But many of these data sets are so complex and so black box type that unless you have been deeply involved in them, unless you have grown uh, intimate with the data, it's difficult to understand what exactly is happening. And uh, therefore you may have these data bits that are shared, but there's no understanding of what exactly is shared. Uh, obviously the extreme situation is when you see data sets that are shared without having a, a variable code book. Uh, this is not uncommon, I've seen that. But even if you have pretty good documentation, you don't know often the dynamics of how the data were collected. And you really need to spend some time to understand whether these data are able to tell you anything. For example, it's always a good idea to do some data dredging and, and some, some playing with the data set to understand whether you can even trust anything about it. So if, if you look at the gender variable and uh, the prostate cancer variable and you, you find out that there's many women who have prostate cancer, then you know, probably you have to be very careful on whether that data set can really be used for any serious research effort. So big data are transforming many fields. They're transforming genetics, they're transforming physical sciences, they're uh, transforming uh, public health, they're transforming uh, space sciences, uh, many domains that collect lots of information. However, even though they have lots of advantages, they also have the disadvantage of introducing big noise and big error. And one needs to be able to balance the advantage of more information versus more error and more biases. Here's where reproducibility comes as a, a key element that you want to have in uh, either small data sets or large data sets. Almost every scientific field is using the term reproducibility. Almost every scientific field is using the term more frequently over time. This is an empirical snapshot of uh, the use of the term reproducibility of results uh, across all 20 major fields of science. Uh, more or less all of them are using it more frequently. But, but what do people mean? People mean different things by reproducibility. We can basically classify it into three groups. Reproducibility of methods, reproducibility of results, and reproducibility of inferences. Reproducibility of methods uh, is the ability to understand what has been done. And therefore also, if you wish to repeat as exactly as possible, 
the experimental, the computational procedures. Most of the time, until recently, methods had been in fine print. They were very elliptical. They sounded more like poetry, uh, actually difficult to understand poetry. And uh, very often people complained that I, I can't really repeat these methods. I don't understand what was happening. People had to reach out to the original investigators to get explanations, or they had to visit their labs to try to see what exactly they had done. Uh, and very often there was like a secret that, uh, oh, I tried this method and I couldn't make it work. Really, I, I tried as well and I didn't make it work. And, and then 5, 10, 20 people would meet in the corridors of conferences and they would all say, no, that, that paper by John Yanis, there's no way I can, I can make it to work in my own hands uh, and no one can, can really do it. But now you cannot meet in the corridors of uh, conferences. Uh, uh, maybe we can share that information on Zoom. Uh, but people have realized that we need more transparency, more detail, more meat about uh, what exactly happened in producing some scientific results. So here come now reproducibility of results, which is the ability to produce corroborating results in a new study, having followed the same experimental methods. This is not the original research data. This is yet new data. It's a new study. And you can decide how you want to design it, whether you want to, to be an exact replication, trying to be as faithful as possible to the original in every single detail, in every single aspect, or you want to diversify a little bit or more than a little bit, but basically you try to see whether you get the same result. Uh, and uh, if you don't, then you start worrying, especially if the original intention was to use exactly the same methods to have exact replication. The elephant in uh, the room is reproducibility of inferences. I think we can make quite a lot of progress on reproducibility of methods and reproducibility of results, but then you have to interpret these methods and these results and what they have found. What do they mean? Is that a strong signal? Is it a weak signal? Is it an applicable signal? Is it generalizable? Should I use it? Should I give this medication to patients? Should I use these public health measures? This is making knowledge claims of similar strength from a study replication and multiple studies sometimes. Uh, occasionally, there may be hundreds of studies. Nevertheless, when you have experts looking at these hundreds of studies, they reach different conclusions. They reach different inferences for various reasons. Sometimes they have genuinely different interpretations. Other times they're conflicted. They may have financial conflicts. They may have sponsors uh, who intervene. They may have allegiance or confirmation bias. They may want to put spin in how they interpret the results. Many fields have increasingly used reproducibility checks to see where their fields have been in terms of performing science and whether they can use exact replication or replication that is as close to exact as possible to try to get uh, originally published uh, efforts to be replicated. The, the most famous experiment in the last six years is the Open Science Collaboration Paper in Science in 2015 where 271 psychologists and their teams joined forces. They decided to take 100 papers uh, roughly from three of their top journals and to repeat the experimental work as closely as possible to the original with communication with the original investigators. Sometimes it was not possible to get it exactly in the same way, but they tried to be as faithful as they could. And as you can see here, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, they couldn't really see a result that was commensurate with what had been seen in the original study. The original study almost always had significant results. Their applications, only about a third of them had nominally statistically significant results. The original studies had a much stronger average effect size compared to the replications. Some of the replications were actually having effect size estimates in the opposite direction compared to the effects uh, in the original studies. So you can read these results in different ways. Uh, there was some debate and some lack of consensus and some dissenting scientists. But I think one way to read it is that about two thirds of the time, there was no replication. And uh, uh, that means that uh, probably this is not very good news you know, for people who thought that all of these results were rock solid. There were many other such efforts. Here's one that looked at uh, papers that were published uh, in Nature and Science. Uh, ideally, the, the most famous and prestigious journals, so one might think that uh, they have very stringent processes of selecting what to publish, and they would make sure that what they publish is correct. Uh, these are 
reproducibility checks for 21 studies published in Science and Nature. And as you can see, there were many situations where the uh, replication studies really found no effect at all. There were many others that they found some effect, but actually it was smaller compared to what the original study had suggested. The average effect was about 50% of the original in the replication or, or reproducibility efforts. And the question is, can you tell which study will be reproduced and which study will not be reproduced? If, if we can tell that, then um, maybe it's not so much of a problem. Then we, we know that we have published all these papers in Nature and Science, but everybody knows that oh, don't take that paper seriously, even though it's a science publication, it's wrong. And, and conversely, take that paper very seriously because it is correct. So can we really predict? And uh, this is an open question. Uh, these are some data that uh, Anna Drebber, uh, Thomas Pfeiffer, and uh, other scientists tried to address with some of these reproducibility checks. Uh, I, I have been discussing with uh, Thomas Pfeiffer about uh, prediction markets uh, probably for about 15 years now. And um, I'm very glad to see that that got applied eventually to the reproducibility world. Uh, these are the data of um, the market price for different hypotheses uh, based on um, what the prediction was on surveys, on surveys that were expertise weighted and on markets. In, in markets, you don't have just experts, but you have people who invest their money in a sense to buy stock of hypotheses that they feel will be reproduced. And conversely, they sell on hypotheses that they feel will not be reproduced. So, so there's a little bit more of uh, uh, something real at stake in trying to make uh, a prediction that will eventually be validated. And it does seem to work a bit better than surveys. It does work a bit better than chance. One might argue, how come? somehow these researchers who participated in the markets or even in the surveys apparently had some private knowledge. They had some knowledge that uh, told them that this hypothesis is more likely to be replicated compared to some other one. That may not necessarily have been completely private. There are other pieces of data for these experiments that may be informing us about the chances that they're correct. So no study is really alone in the universe. There are other studies that bear in the same neighborhood their weight, and therefore you may guess a little bit more than just by chance on what will happen with a specific scientific experiment. I think if you were to apply prediction markets in fields where there's no prior and where there's no other supporting pieces of evidence, it's gonna be very difficult for the prediction markets to work. Conversely, if you work in fields where there is other evidence, perhaps there's unpublished evidence, but perhaps people have tried to run experiments and they know that they have failed, there's a lot of unpublished, the invisible iceberg below the tip of the iceberg that is published, then I think prediction markets might work uh, pretty well. Here's a field where prediction markets, I think, would not have worked, trying to predict which genes are associated with specific diseases. And I say that because for many years, for several decades, we were publishing papers where people were selecting, based on their best evidence, you know, what they knew about biology and about physiology and about anything that they knew, they were selecting the best genes that they thought would be associated with uh, specific diseases for whatever reason. And then they were doing studies, they were finding signals that were nominally statistically significant, they were publishing those, and thousands of such papers were published. Until we reached the point that we realized we were getting nowhere because those were not replicable. And we had major advances. We had the ability now not to cherry pick genes and variants, but we could look at the entire genome and look at all the variants, these that we had checked before and many, many others. We could do that with very large sample sizes, with large collaboration practices, with intense replication across multiple teams. And basically only 1.2% of these previously published claimed discoveries could be replicated. Maybe a bit more would be true if you assume that some were very subtle and uh, the power even of large studies is not perfect. So maybe it's 3% or 5%, but the vast majority, 95%, if not more, were not really true signals. They were just signals that arose under the best circumstances and with the best intentions, but they were false positives. And I, I think that many scientific fields are still operating with that intense thinking and theorizing and trying to put together whatever prior you have 
based on other lines of evidence and then going after specific targets one at a time. And I, I think that their replication rate may not necessarily be better compared to genetics. We had the ability to move to the next stage in genetics. We haven't had the ability to move to that massive large-scale testing in other fields like nutrition, for example, or, or lifestyle. Some other fields that have uh, paid a lot of attention to replication in the last uh, 10 years uh, is uh, preclinical research. Preclinical research is of great interest to the biomedical industry, and the uh, biomedical industry actually played a leading role in launching some of the reproducibility efforts in that field. Why? Uh, because they depend on these preclinical findings for developing drug targets and then developing blockbusters. So if they hear of some research that is done at uh, Harvard or Stanford or University of Pittsburgh, and uh, you have these uh, highly cited researchers who came up with this new drug target, then they have to invest half a, million, half a billion dollars to develop a new drug. So if they invest on something that is not a true lead, they will waste half a billion dollars. So they tried to reproduce the results that were published by the best of the best academic teams, and their success rate varied from 0% to 20% in most of these efforts. In uh, one of them, published by Glenn uh, Begley in Nature in 2012, his conclusion was after he could only replicate uh, uh, six uh, out of almost 50 of these prominent claims, said that the, the war on cancer is being lost uh, because much of our basic research is, is wrong. It's just false. This leads to a lot of uneasy feelings. Uh, as someone who is making discoveries, being refuted is not uh, a good situation to be. And it can lead to a lot of animosity. It can lead to a perception that, oh my goodness, my work is being refuted. Therefore, I'm a bad scientist. Maybe that can be extrapolated. I'm a fraudulent scientist. Uh, there, there is intolerance to refutation. And especially if the dominant paradigm is that science, everything we do must be correct. If it's not correct, that's a serious problem. That creates very high bar of, of expectations. While in truth, probably we should set a bar to say, well, 99% uh, of what you will discover is likely to be false at the first run. So, if you get 2% correct and 98% wrong, then you should be very happy with that. that. You know, clearly that's not fraud. You did your best. Congratulations, you were wrong 98% of the time. But this, this has been a situation of growing pains and uh, making lots of people uneasy. We, we saw a lot of kind of personal contrasts and, uh, and battles being fought in the reproducibility wars. Uh, people questioned how replication should be done, what successful replication meant or unsuccessful or uninterpretable because no, that's not the same thing. Whether we should have exact replication, whether we should just go for some sort of conceptual replication, but then what exactly counts as conceptual replication, whether triangulation is the way to go, but again, how do you define these triangles of, of other pieces of evidence that, that corroborate uh, some part of them and lots of contesting perspectives. As I said, there is resistance to refutation. We have seen empirically in different fields that um, there is uh, uh, many studies that fail to replicate, but even after they fail to replicate, people continue to cite them heavily. They continue to cite them as much as they were cited before they were refuted, sometimes even more compared to before they were refuted and if you look at um, why do they cite them, it's not that they cite them to say that that study by John was wrong. They cited to say that study by John was correct. And uh, either they ignore the refutation or they come up with counter arguments to come up with a conclusion that no, these other studies, they were very poorly done. They didn't look at the same question. They had differences, they had biases, they had errors, and therefore, uh, we still need to trust the original finding. This means that in a growing universe of science where we have 200 million scholarly documents, it's likely that many of them, perhaps most of them are really false, but they're not going to be abandoned. They're not going to be retracted. They will continue to be supported and they will continue to feed into the literature, probably propagating further misleading results. So the self-correction function is 
not really optimally performing, some of those eventually will die out because there will be no more researchers working in that field. But it's not that you will find so easily these very clear cut refutations, let alone retractions. There are hints of biases that one can track with empirical evidence uh, across science, and uh, there's different ways to do that. Uh, this is a, an empirical approach where we used, along with uh, Dan Fanelli and Rodrigo Costa's data from uh, over 3,000 meta-analysis and about 200,000 studies worth of data, and we pre-specified what would the patterns of data on the same question look like. These data are included in meta-analysis of that question if you have different biases operating. For example, small study effects is a bias where small studies give different results compared to large studies. And you can see how that operates. If you have a meta-analysis of multiple studies, you can test whether small studies give different results compared to large studies. Similarly, gray literature bias, uh, gray literature giving different effects, different results compared to other studies. Decline effect, if you have early published uh, results that are more exaggerated compared to later results. Early extremes or the Proteus phenomenon, which means that you have an early exaggerated result very quickly because that result creates animosity and an opportunity to refute it. You have a result that is very extreme in the opposite direction. And then the su subsequent studies are filling in the gap between these two extremes. Citation bias, studies done in different countries like the US giving different results. Industry bias that is sponsored by the industry giving more favorable results. And then social characteristics of science, like pressures to publish, country level policies, or like cash incentives, or career incentives, or institutional incentives, productivity indices, how do they shape the credibility or the effect sizes of a researcher, uh, the type of impact a researcher has, whether there's mutual control with large team size, uh, with lots of researchers who can cross-check the same data with uh, different countries or different teams participating in the same investigation. And finally, individual risk factors, including career level, gender, and prior breaches of, of research integrity. So we could hypothesize that each of these patterns would reveal themselves in a given way. And then we try to see if there are footprints of uh, these biases. And we could see footprints of these biases in most scientific fields, most of the time, but not to the same extent across scientific fields. For example, small study effects were very prominent in social sciences and in biological sciences. They were not really very prominent in physical sciences. And I, I can think that in many physical sciences, they have just very vast amounts of data. They don't have a problem with small sample size. A decline effect had a different impact in social, uh, biological and physical sciences. Um, U.S. studies tend to have more prominent effects in social sciences and biology, not necessarily though, not at all actually, in physical sciences. Let me add one final dimension, utility. Should science be useful? Well, uh, most of it doesn't have to be useful. It, it will prove useful. I think, as I said, it's the best thing that has happened to humans. And some of that at some point may also prove to be useful. It will save lives. It will help us uh, leave this planet as we are soon going to destroy it. And unfortunately, um, it, it will save humankind, hopefully. Uh, but most research is not done with one particular deliverable. But there is a lot of research that has deliverables. And when it comes to clinical research, for example, utility is important. You, you, you don't do clinical research just out of curiosity. You're seeing patients, you want to save their lives, you want to improve their quality of life. Unfortunately, even these types of research are not useful most of the time. Now, how do you judge that? Uh, these are eight features or eight criteria that I came up with uh, that I think you need to ask to try to understand whether research is useful. Uh, first question is, what is the problem base? Are we dealing with a problem here? Is there a problem that we need to solve? Is it big enough? Is it important enough? Or are we creating a problem that does not exist? Uh, a, a lot of research in clinical medicine and in public health is creating problems that do not exist so that specialists can then advocate and uh, show off as, as experts. Context placement, has prior evidence been systematically assessed to inform the need for new studies? Maybe we already have too many studies, maybe we have 200 studies, why are we throwing yet another one in the mix? Information gain, is the proposed study large and long enough to be sufficiently informative? Are we going to learn something, not only if the result has the best 
expected results, which might be nice looking, statistically significant, but let's say that the result is completely null. Is that going to offer us information gain? Pragmatism. Are we dealing with research that reflects real life? And if it does deviate, does it matter? Can we really apply that research eventually if it's done under very experimental, idealistic conditions? Patient-centeredness. Does the research reflect top patient priorities? Have we asked people who would be affected? What is important for them? What matters to them? What is their value system and how research can be integrated with their value system in terms of uh, what knowledge it will produce? Value for money. There's so many things that we can do and we have so limited resources. Is the research worth the money and the investment? Visibility, can we do it? There's lots of clinical research that is abandoned because of utility. People envision that we can enroll a thousand patients and then we can enroll only 50 patients and the whole research just goes to trash. Finally, transparency. Are the methods, the data and the analysis verifiable and unbiased? And there's obviously lots of dimensions to that. If you look across the board, if you take all clinical research, there's only a very small segment, it's a very small proportion of studies that actually fulfill this criteria. And even if you go to the very top select major general journals, medical journals, uh, they may be a little better, but again, most studies do not fulfill this criteria. The, the other problem with just limiting yourself to the major journals is they only publish 1% of the scientific literature. So uh, on average, most of the useful and interesting studies will not be in, in these journals, even though they have a, a pretty good representation, probably. This is another empirical piece of uh, evaluation looking at 1,400 topics uh, in uh, clinical medicine and public health and all sorts of interventions published by the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews over a year and a half. Only about 43% of them had grade summary of findings, which is grades of recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation. The others had no evidence at all, more or less, or at least many of them. The quality of the evidence for the first listed primary outcome was high only 13.5% of the time. Even when we considered all the outcomes, only 19.1% had at least one outcome with high quality of evidence. And if you sought reviews, topics with high quality of evidence, statistically significant results, and the authors eventually saying that uh, I'm making a favorable interpretation for the intervention, only 25 out of the 1394, which is less than 2% of the reviews and medical interventions had that ideal constellation of evidence. Different fields, as I said, they differ in their research practices. They also differ in the results that they get. Uh, this is uh, an early paper by Dan Fanelli where he looked across all major fields of science in terms of what is the proportion of papers that find results in support of the tested uh, original hypothesis. And fields like psychiatry and psychology or many fields in medicine, they have 90% or even higher rates of quote-unquote success. Um, other fields like space science and physical sciences, they're down to the 60s, which is much less. Um, that could be an inverse hierarchy of science. You know, the more successful you are, probably the, the less trustworthy on average the results would be. It might just mean that the field is under more pressure to show off statistically significant results. And in, in medicine, this is very prominent. If you just look at any p-values, not just the primary hypothesis, but any p-values, whenever you see p-values in the abstract or in the full text, 96% of the biomedical literature has some statistically significant results. It claims significant results. And obviously this cannot be so. We have made great progress in medicine, but it's entirely incompatible with uh, any realistic scenario that 96% of our papers have significant results, novel results, important results, and, and so forth. I have already talked about uh, different efforts that uh, different fields are making to change some of their practices and try to optimize the chances of getting something that is reproducible and uh, something that is uh, trustworthy and eventually useful as well. And some of these recipes work for many fields, others may work for fewer fields, but here's a partial list, large scale collaboration, team science, adoption of replication culture, registration at multiple levels, sharing, reproducibility practices and reproducibility checks, containment of conflicted sponsors and authors, more appropriate statistical methods, standardization of definitions and analysis, more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improvement of study design standards, improvements in peer review, reporting and dissemination of research, 
better training of the scientific workforce in methods and statistical literacy. Let me complement my original observations with a few more examples of how this might work. Team science does work in some fields that can produce lots of data and different stakeholders can share all their data and create a composite that is much larger than uh, what each individual player can do. And this is the classic success story for genetics. Standardization is something that many fields can use. There's a tension between standardization and innovation. People think that if you standardize, you're less of an innovator. And I think that it, it is true in the early discovery phase, but uh, very quickly, I think people need to think about how to standardize. This is an empirical assessment that I did with Rebecca Martin, who's a, a great uh, young neuroscientist looking at uh, uh, published uh, dopaminergic uh, differentiation methods uh, from stem cells that you try to create uh, uh, cells that perhaps can be transplanted to my brain to, to make it a little better. And uh, there's just different methods. It's, each paper is trying something a little different. Some of these papers get a lot of attraction and many citations, others don't get much attention. And uh, the question is, why don't we try to standardize? There's some exploration phase, but after a certain point, some standardization would help. Registration can help, but obviously a lot of research cannot be registered. It is completely exploratory and it should be acknowledged as such. There's a lot of research that has been uh, using pre-existing data and therefore registering maybe does not make as much sense as registering the data set, uh, saying what that data set is describing its potential, the variables that it includes, the multiplicity of uh, parameters that have been collected. It's a little bit like describing the nuclear arsenal that I have that data set and tonight I can launch 1 billion p-values against you if I cannot sleep uh, playing with, with these data. You, you get a sense of what is the, the multiplicity of that data set and its potential. Registration of protocol has become very popular in some fields like uh, clinical trials, but it's less um, of a trend in other fields. Registration of analysis plan goes beyond a protocol because uh, it's uh, very unclear in most protocols how exactly the analysis are going to be run. Protocol analysis plan and raw data allow for maximal transparency. And finally, open live streaming, which means that each step, even in exploratory search, even in iterative process, is communicated ahead of time to the rest of the community. For example, someone is posting online, these are the experiments that I'm going to do. Give me your feedback and input. I will revise them. Here's the new version. I will run them. I will show you the results. And then we will jointly design the, the next phase of experiments. Many fields are increasingly believing that they can and should share their data widely. For example, this is a paper we published uh, about a year, uh, two years ago in science uh, with uh, 70 other people. We said that when it comes to public genomic data, unrestricted access to everyone should be the norm. Actually, it should happen immediately. We should not even wait for those who produce the data to publish them because most of the time, these data are going to be small fragments. If they just try to publish something, it will be wrong <laughs> most of the time, or it will not be very revealing. What will be revealing, what will be correct, what will be useful would be the compilation of multiple data sets from tens and hundreds of investigators, and then making sure that everyone who has contributed will get credit for that. Is sharing happening? As you know, not very much. In most fields, sharing is pretty limited. Can we make it happen? Uh, this is one such effort. We called it the ARC uh, project. And uh, along with Tom Hardwick, we wrote to the investigators of the most highly cited papers in psychiatry and psychology. We asked them to share their data from their most highly cited studies uh, in the world, in the world literature. And with no funding, we offered to curate them and make them available in a standardized fashion for everyone to use. We, we did get some data sets, but the vast majority were not contributed. And the reasons for that, the most common reason was not that the researchers were still using the data to publish their own papers. The most common reason was that the data sets were outside of the researchers' control. So we, we've seen that many Principal investigators, they never get to see the data, especially if they have sponsorship arrangements that the sponsor of the industry will run the analysis for them. And then they will just have to write the papers or interpret the papers or write the results. 
but they never get to see the data. They have no control on the data. We saw that in COVID-19 with papers that were retracted where we had famous authors from Harvard who were given data, for example, on hydroxychloroquine, supposedly coming from six or 700 institutions around the world. They never saw these data. These data were fake. Uh, and I think that it, it creates a major tension. Many other obstacles, legal, ethical, preparing own systems, data no longer exist and, and resources. I think different fields have uh, moved to a different extent to try to overcome uh, these obstacles. In, in some cases, we have seen real progress. Some journals, for example, in medicine, like BMJ and PLOS Medicine, are not allowing you to publish a paper unless you say that you will share all the raw data with anyone who is asking for them. And we did ask for them, along with Loriano Dett and my colleagues, uh, in that evaluation, we, we asked all the corresponding authors of trials publishing these two journals under that policy, and uh, we got 46% of them, which is half empty, half full, much higher yield compared to previous efforts. We did reanalyze also all these data, and we gave pretty much the same conclusions as uh, the original publications. We found a little bit of an error here and there, but no serious error that would invalidate the result. So it's a moving frontier and reproducibility is not something that is static. It's not something that we can gain and then have forever. It's something that we need to seek constantly to try to improve. When we looked at a random sample of the entire biomedical literature from 2000 to 2014, we saw that um, there was hardly any data sharing. There was hardly any protocol uh, availability it was really the exception, hardly ever happening. Uh, there were some papers reporting conflicts of interest and it was increasing over time and some papers reporting funding. When we repeated the exercise 2015 to 17, we saw much more action. And now we have a paper coming out soon in PLOS Biology looking at even more recent data it has become even better. So you can take a look, for example, at the proportion of papers that are sharing data. And you see that uh, it has gradually escalated from close to 0% to about 20, 25% uh, sharing some data and about 15 to 20% sharing all the data in the paper by uh, 2019 or 2020. Funding declarations and conflicts of interest declarations have also improved. Uh, uh, more papers are willing to say that what they do is replication. Uh, of course, almost all papers, they will say that they're doing something novel on top of whatever else. So there is, there is progress, there is movement. There's other frontiers that I think we can improve. Uh, for example, computational methods are relatively low hanging fruit in terms of reproducibility. If we cannot have transparency on computational methods, we cannot make the data run. We cannot see what they get. And I think that this becomes an increasingly prominent challenge and requirement, the more complex types of modeling are being uh, applied across different fields. Uh, there's a trade off between transparency and complexity. If you want to have transparency for very complex models like lots of artificial intelligence, deep neural network algorithm, you really need to specify very carefully each of the steps, each one of the degrees of freedom, how you handle them. We have a, a matters arising paper in Nature with several colleagues published a few months ago, where we go through all the steps that you can think to optimize uh, that transparent sharing of the methodology uh, for reproducible checks uh, in artificial intelligence. As I mentioned, different fields have different patterns of openness. And that shows here in empirical evaluations done in biomedicine, psychology, and social sciences for open access, for materials availability, for data availability. Analysis availability is almost never uh, well documented, unfortunately. Pre-registration, very slow progress. Protocol availability, hardly any progress with few exceptions in sub-disciplines. Conflict of interest statements and funding statements, uh, much better picture, but again, with differences across fields. Improvements in statistics can also help. And uh, we can think of how to change the entire scientific statistical literacy of the scientific workforce, but this cannot be done overnight. Uh, what do we do in the meanwhile before we make everyone, all 20 million people publishing papers become statisticians, obviously a utopian dream. Well, many fields are using statistical significance with very lenient thresholds. So one option is to just move the threshold to make it a bit more stringent from 0 0.05 to 0 0.005. It's, it's not a panacea, but at least many of the old findings that were thought to be significant will, will now be suggested, not, not significant. And, and it will be a little bit more difficult to 
do the p hacking, which probably people will still continue to do uh, to get through a, a more stringent threshold. Completely abandoning some of our statistical tools. That's another option. Null hypothesis significance testing is used 90, 95% of the time, but probably it's the best solution for only about 20% of research. So we can think of uh, different types of statistical approaches, uh, lower p-values, abandoning p-values, and uh, uh, using alternative inference methods, focus on effect size and uncertainty. As I said before, train the scientific workforce and get more people knowledgeable about biases that lead to inflated results. We can do all of that to, to different extents, and each one of them is a little bit of a utopia if you want to, to do it perfectly, but, but we can make progress to some extent on all these fronts. And let me close with, with uh, a, a simulation. Uh, this is a model of a universe of science, like the one that I showed in the very beginning, but it's a multifunctional universe of science. How, how do we create that universe? It's, it's an artificial model. It's uh, 11 equations that create a model of three types of scientists, diligent scientists, careless scientists, and an ethical scientist. And uh, we hope that the large majority of scientists are diligent. There's some careless, and there's hopefully very few who are fraudulent. But then we run that community, these three communities, through rounds of funding and success. And if they can deliver something, they get funded and they continue and they propagate and they create offspring, scientific offspring. The unethical and the careless cohort will grow larger simply because they can get the same products with doing less work. Uh, so you don't need 11 differential equations for that. And they will take over. So we need to find ways to reward good science and, and not reward and perhaps even penalize bad science. How do we do that? We need to think about our reward system. We need to think of how we reward not just productivity, but also the quality, the reproducibility, the sharing and the translational impact of research. It runs like an electrocardiogram, PQRST. And uh, there's a lot of thoughts going into this. Uh, we have done empirical surveys. We've had workshops about criteria for tenure, for promotion, uh, for hiring faculty. Most institutions are not yet uh, competent in thinking about these other dimensions between productivity, papers, and, and funding that faculty accrue, but I think that more of that can happen. To conclude, different scientific fields have different standards of practice, and these differences may or may not be justified. Successful research practice may be possible to transplant from one discipline to many others. The extent to what transplantation can be successful can be debated, of course. Interdisciplinary efforts may be best to improve scientific research in large scale, but field-specific grassroots adoption of standards, I think, is necessary. Transparency, openness, and sharing are likely to help, but the devil is in the details. How to may be highly field-dependent and worthy of more research and, uh, and meta-research. Many thanks to uh, many of my uh, colleagues who uh, shaped some of the work that I, I shared with you today. And uh, again, many thanks to all of you for inviting me and for being here. And I look forward to learning from you from your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this really uh, exciting tour of uh, uh, really your, your research. So let me remind the audience how we're going to work. We're using webinar. Most of you right now are participants. If you have a question for John, please uh, go click on the Q&A button. Uh, it's at the top or the bottom of your screen and write your name. And I will promote you to the status of panelists and you can ask your question directly which is much better than uh, me having to translate your question. It takes usually a few seconds for me to do that. So please bear with me uh, right now and I will start, I will start the process now. All right. And all right, wonderful. Clayton, please go ahead while I am uh, uh, moving the other speaker, the other panelist. Clayton, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, I can hear you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Ionidis, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. I've always been uh, a real fan of your publications and followed um, all the recent developments. Uh, I also want to thank you for uh, you know weighing in on the COVID uh, pandemic and all of the, uh, I'm sure, uh, blowback that you get from um, participating in that, uh, that dialogue. Um, in, in the good old days, investigators, you know, would rely on peer review for uh, discovering the truth. And I think you nicely summarized exactly how problematic that is. And 
Well, there's been an incredible proliferation of scientific journals uh, where you really begin to wonder about peer review, if it's even done in that, and not to mention the social media. You kind of ended on a positive note uh, that you felt things had a chance of getting better. So do you think that in the future, it's going to be easier for us to discern the truth because of implementation of some of the policies that you mentioned? I, I think that um, transparency helps peer review in, in multiple ways. So if, if you have the data shared, if you have protocols, if you have code, if you have uh, more details and methods, uh, all of these features are making peer review more meaningful. And currently peer review indeed maybe improves about 30% of papers. It makes five to 10% papers worse. <laughs> and uh, about two thirds are not really touched at all or, or they're touched very superficially. It's mostly aesthetics uh, that are changing or, or even worse, people are just forcing their na- language, their narrative, you know, the reviewers and the, the editors impose a word view on how they want the results to be read. But that's not really creating better science necessarily. So if we really want to have meaningful review, we need to make some progress on these other practices. Does it mean that someone will really spend their time to look over the data and to look over more details uh, if if, uh, data become available? Not necessarily, but some people might uh, do that. I think that there's lots of people who want to look very carefully. I think that currently we see a lot of buzz in social media of people who some of them being knowledgeable, most of them having no clue about what they're talking about, none of them really looking at data, just you know, taking for granted that they have a worldview and they see a paper that is against their worldview or against their belief system or against what they believe about uh, what that uh, scientific parameter should be and, and uh, they go into a spree. So I, I think we need more essence. We, we need more science. We need, we need less cheap talk and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and more serious data and, and serious evaluation of, of data. We need more replication also. If, if we have replication, I mean, that's one way to peer review in a way. It doesn't mean that non-replication means that the original is false. Um, it doesn't mean that the, the, the replication is correct or the replication is false, but, but it's, it's an added amount of evidence. So we are in a better place compared to just being in a place where we we just fight over something that we, we don't really see what it is that, that we're fighting about. Thank you very much. John Fuller, go for it, John. Okay, so thanks very much, John. I appreciate you making good on your statement that meta research interfaces with history and philosophy of science by joining us today. Um, and um, a few philosophers of science, including myself, have been thinking about just what the implications are of many of the meta-research findings that you and others have been producing. I think the most common response, not only in philosophy of science, but also it seems in medicine, are along the lines of how do we correct our current methods, our current research infrastructure to stop these kinds of biases and problems from continuing to inflict the evidence base. So in response to the evidence on publication bias, what can we do to reduce this in the future, whether that's creating trial registries, policies at journals to enforce this, or what have you. But I'm interested in a different question. So how do we, what should we do, given that these biases that are detected by the field of meta-research already exist in our existing first-order evidence? So in other words, faced with a piece of first-order therapeutic evidence, like let's say the results of a clinical trial, how should the results of meta-research inform my judgment about how effective that intervention is? So maybe to, maybe to make this more concrete, um, I'll just bring up two examples from one from your own research and then one from others' research. So, you know, as you know, uh, there have been many meta-analyses done on industry bias, the finding that industry-sponsored drug and device studies are more likely to show positive results, report favorable conclusions and whatnot. And we're even able to quantify how much more likely an industry-sponsored study is likely to show a positive result latest systematic review in Cochrane was in 2017, you know, it put a number to this value. Okay, so that's that's one piece of meta science that might suggest that faced with an individual piece of industry sponsored therapeutic research, all things being equal, I should be less confident that that result is unbiased compared to a non industry sponsored study. Okay, second example, this one come this one relates to replicability and reproducibility, and it's from your own research. So this, this study really impressed me when I read it. So um, 
The study was by Tiago Pereira, Ralph Horwitz, and yourself from 2012 in JAMA, where you looked across the entire Cochrane database of systematic reviews and found that whenever there was an initial clinical trial showing a very large treatment effect, subsequent meta-analysis of trials, 90% of the time, substantially reduced the effect size estimate. And a third of the time found no statistically significant effect associated with the intervention. That's despite the fact that initially we had a, a clinical trial, probably a randomized clinical trial, showing a very large effect of the intervention. Okay, so faced with this, what am I to do as a clinician or as an evidence user? And I want to make one proposal and, and, and get your thoughts on this. So one thing you might think is that these kinds of meta-research findings provide a kind of evidence base for first-order evidence evaluation. So to take the grade approach to rating the quality of evidence, currently grade just relies on features of studies like, you know, was it randomized? Um, was, the, was the effect size estimate precise? The kinds of findings that one could see by looking at the first order piece of evidence that you're evaluating. But if I'm someone who's just read and been impressed by that JAMA study in 2012, I might think that finding that an, an initial randomized controlled trial has just found a very large treatment effect associated with an intervention. I actually shouldn't be that impressed with that result, given the fact that you've identified this large trend across the Cochrane database. So I wanna put this proposal out there and suggest that it seems to be at least partially a novel one because evidence evaluation schemes like GRADE currently aren't doing this. They kind of, they rely on measures that, you know, statistical theory or epidemiological theory t uh, tells us to, is important when we're identifying whether or not a study is biased, but it doesn't seem to track the kinds of more surprising findings that might come out of the field of meta-research and that maybe aren't suggested directly by statistical or epidemiological theory. Uh, absolutely, that, that's a, a, a wonderful comment and it, it, it gives me opportunity to, to really discuss uh, some issues that are probably not, uh, not shared very widely. As you say, most of our evidence landscape is focusing on appraising single studies or single meta-analysis. And uh, we have many tools that do that very well. You know, nothing is perfect, but, but there's a lot of interest on this. What I'm saying though, and, and what, what you're saying, I believe, is that you need to look at the bigger picture. You need to look at that, that higher level evidence into which a study or a meta-analysis of multiple studies is embedded. Because if that larger picture says that, well, everything in that field is wrong, <laughs> no matter what, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, no matter what that single study is doing and no matter what uh, the meta-analysis of five such single studies are doing, you have the evidence of the entire field just being wrong. And, and that is an overwhelming prior that bears upon that single study or five studies or meta-analysis. Now, of course, that's a very extreme scenario. And, and it's not that it's so easy to say that, oh, that field is entirely wrong. But meta-empirical evaluations, they can give you that sense, as you said, industry studies tend to have that sort of an inflation. Small studies tend to have you know, poor performance when you try to perform uh, larger studies to see if they get the same result. So if you are in a situation where you have an industry study or a small study, you have to be very cautious, even though it may look very nice on our scales that we apply and that we throw on, on that single study. That can make you paranoid also. <laughs> so I, I think that that tends you to think that many studies may be wrong when everything looks fine. <laughs> and um, to give you one example, recently I was working on a meta-analysis and, and my um, colleagues and, and postdocs and, and young fellows, they, they came up with that very nice result. I said, wow, that's, that's an amazing result. It's uh, clearly so saving lives, statistically significant. And I look at it and I, I see that this result is driven by very small studies. And I say, I don't believe that result, but it's significant. No, no, I don't believe. I, I think that we will ruin our careers if, if, if we publish that. Um, and we were, we were saved because very soon uh, there was large scale evidence that was produced that showed that actually there was, there was no effect in, in that situation. 
So, I mean, this is just one example. And in, in that case, I was not paranoid. In other cases, though, I may be paranoid. <laughs> and if you go down that path, you may be excluding some small studies that may be very useful. So I'm not saying to exclude and throw away small studies, but to be extra careful beyond the level of uncertainty that is conveyed just by the traditional statistical uncertainty and the uncertainty that is conveyed by a risk of bias tool that is focused on just that study or just that meta-analysis. You have to, to, to see how is that bigger universe performing. Same applies to, to industry studies. Um, in, in fact, the problem with industry studies is not so much on the results as on the interpretation. The, re the results are not so biased and, and they have done better over time, I believe, but it's the interpretation that is biased. So, and and uh, this could be both the design, for example, people using a placebo comparison instead of uh, an active comparison, that's an easy trick, uh, or using a, in non-inferiority designs, a, a huge non-inferiority boundary that you can never say that this is not inferior, uh, or, or just using spin in the final interpretation. So, so the effect size may be fine, but the final conclusion that this is a wonderful drug and everybody should use it, that's what you need to be very careful. That's the added gain of having a look at the galaxy and the universe rather than the, the dot, uh, which I showed in the very first slide. I mean, that, that's my main message. You know, look at the universe, don't look at the dot. The universe can tell you a lot about whether you're in a land where there's uh, uh, aliens uh, who are going to kill you or who are going to offer you a feast. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, we have a very long queue. Uh, Vitaly Pronsik, please. Uh, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, hello, John. D thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting talk. I have a question about your classification of reproducibilities, because there is a big discussion in, on, in the philosophy side on the reproducibility terms. Uh, the, uh, I am especially interested in the reproducibility of inferences because how the, could you uh, please give an example or discuss an example when results stay the same, uh, results stay reproducible, but inferences are not. On the philosophical side, I would understand it as a paradigmatic shift, for example, if data stays the same, but, but they, uh, previously they, they were interpreted as a phlogiston, for example, and later after the paradigmatic shift as an oxygen, for example. So the theory shift. Is this, is this uh, how you understand in, uh, uh, reproducibility of uh, inferences true, or there is another meaning, uh, something else is implied under this? That, that's, that's a good paradigm. Um, but uh, I, I can think of, of different situations. For example, in medicine, this is a very common phenomenon in, uh, in guidelines. Uh, guidelines pretty much depend on the same evidence, the same trials, the same results, the same meta-analysis, the same summary, the same uncertainty. Uh, however, if you have a guideline on uh, treatments for hypertension by cardiologists versus by family practitioners, they may lead to very different interpretations and therefore different recommendations on what to do. You know, one, one would say use very aggressive antihypertensive treatment. We have strong evidence to suggest that you should lower your blood pressure to very low levels and uh, cardiologists might suggest that family practitioners may say, no, uh, I, I don't think that these data are, are telling that you need to do this. You, you have to be a bit more conservative, try other things and it will be just fine. Or interpretations by industry stakeholders versus independent stakeholders or interpretations by people who have developed a theory or have developed a tool or have developed a model versus those who are independent. There's some sort of uh, of allegiance bias here in how they read the results uh, that, oh, my tool is the best. No, I don't really see a difference or maybe it's even inferior compared to, to other tools. So it, it, it varies from, from one field to another, but I, at least in medicine, I've seen it very prominently, uh, people reading the same results in very different ways and having no consensus on how they read them. It can happen in, in other sciences as well. I, I think the more objective and the more detached the, the field from um, and and with no conflicts with no expectations not not one result being better looking than another 
I think the, the less that problem is likely to be. Mm. So, uh, just to clarify, uh, uh, let, let, let me interrupt. We have a very long list of people, so I, I'm afraid I, I, I must cut the exchange here. I apologize uh, on this one. Oh, Edouard, I think you're, you're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one year on Zoom. Uh, Douglas Lancito, please, uh, you're next. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I just had a thought, and I'm curious to uh, get your feelings on it. Uh, to me, although all of these ideas with reproducibility, with p-value hacking, and so on and so forth are all necessary, um, it seems that a major part of the problem is still that money is always going to be, to some degree, at the center of uh, faculties, positions, and promotions. And as long as money is fed by what's published and what's published is, pot, is fed by positive results. I wonder if perhaps a way, another uh, thought that I hadn't heard, but maybe I missed it, is that journals or at least some subset of them radically shift how they look at reviewing articles to review them instead of post analysis. And I know they have, you know, protocol papers, but have their entire, re their initial review and their decision based on pre analysis, analysis plans and actual data to judge that, yes, we would publish this paper regardless of whether it's statistically significant or not. Um, so I, I just, Wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely. There's uh, a lot of journals that do that. Uh, this is the concept of uh, pre-registered reports. And along with uh, Tom Hardwick, uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago outlining the, the mm -hmm. status of affairs for journals that are doing this, how efficiently they do it, uh, how many papers they have published, how long it takes, uh, whether also papers that are submitted down that path eventually do get published. Uh, do have some concerns that many of them unfortunately, do not get published, uh, or at least do not get published promptly. Uh, basically, the journal is reviewing uh, a, a full paper, but without the specific results populating the tables or figures. And it is accepting it in principle based on the merit that it has as a research question, as a methodology, as an approach, and then has a second uh, round of review once the data are into. Just make sure that, that the, the original promise was followed in terms of what data were collected and analyzed. And if there were deviations, because very often there have to be deviations for various reasons, they're explained in a satisfactory way. So it, it is happening. It's still less than 1% of the literature. It's not a new idea. Uh, some medical journals had experimented with that in the 1990s. For example, Lancet had that approach for clinical trials. It would say that I will preemptively accept a clinical trial because I think that it is important. So if you can do it, then I will publish it based on the fact that I've seen your protocol, I've seen that you're attacking an important question. It, it didn't work as well as one would have hoped. And I, I can think of many reasons for that. Um, probably the, the primary reason is that, that most people do, do not really want to limit their degrees of freedom. And, and the truth is that most research should have degrees of freedom. And, and most research is exploratory. I mean, we, we need to have a lot of exploratory research before we even think of doing confirmatory research. If, if, if the yield is one in a hundred, then you really need to, to try uh, several avenues before anything comes up of any interest that is worth it to invest uh, more effort. Uh, so even though I'm, I'm a strong supporter of pre-registration, I do realize that, that we cannot really ask for all papers or even the majority to be pre-registered. And we, we need to strike the correct balance between exploration and, and confirmation and specification and liberty in, in a sense. Great. Thank you for the background. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, oh, let me just, uh, John Williams, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I'm kind of a ringer. I'm a biomedical scientist. We study viral immunology and mouse models. So I'm familiar with a lot of the limitations you talked about. In fact, I give all my trainees your 2005 paper. So I have kind of a different question and thanks for a great talk. What do you tell your young trainees to sort of 
keep them, you know, on this path that you've described, because as you highlighted, our whole field is pushing them down P values, you know, go for the highest impact, everything you said that we shouldn't do, our field is trying to get them to do. So how do we, what do you tell your young people? Because this is what I'll then tell my young people. <laughs> uh, that it's, it's not easy. It's a, there's a crazy world out there <laughs> and uh, you, you shouldn't uh, really uh, think that it's, it's going to be straightforward. It's not straightforward. Uh, it, it, you, you would need to probably go uh, against the tide uh, to, to do this. Uh, you need to remain calm because it's, uh, it's going to create uh, probably some tension. And uh, that, that there are opportunities in every single research project to do something better. So I, 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 I don't think that we should aim to have the perfect research project because that will never exist. Each research project has an opportunity to do it a bit better. And uh, if you get involved from the very beginning, what I, I tell them is not to be involved in something that is already kind of uh, started and advanced because then they have very little opportunity to shape it the way that they want. They can try to, to make it better. It's never going to be perfect, but they can do it better. And uh, don't be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ted Poston, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, John, for this really interesting talk. So I had a question that was similar to Doug's questions uh, about financial interest. And so I'm wondering if um, pharmaceutical companies and similar uh, place individuals don't face something like a Pascal's wager, you know, here with respect to um, whether to act on a study. So you can think of a very simple decision table where to act or not act and study's good, study's not good. And you approach something of infinite utility if you act and the study is good. And in that case, you require just very little probability that uh, the study is good. And I'm worried here about the epistemological uh, implications of this because over time, uh, you get acts on the basis of just uh, a minimal of evidence. And so I'm kind of, you, you ended on this optimistic note, but I'm honestly, I'm pessimistic here. I'm thinking the Pascal kind of re reasoning is going to end us with a lot of horrible treatments, you know, simply on the basis of the fact that people are, you know, reasoning on um, expected utility here. Yeah. So, yeah. Please comment on that. I, I think that that there's there's inferential reproducibility coming to to that in terms of not the conclusions, but in terms of interpreting uh, the priors in a sense, uh, which are conclusions of previous studies or previous evidence or previous research that we have done, and and how do you piece that together? So people have different understanding about uh, what we know and what we don't know, and and therefore how much more we need to, to move the dial and to, to move forward. I mean, you know, much of the, of the COVID-19 debate that I was uh, involved in was that probably some people felt that we knew far more uh, about what to do, uh, you know, how to intervene, like, you know, lockdown for, I don't know, for three years uh, <laughs> um, versus others who thought that we don't know, that uh, some people said, well, based on what happened in 1918, uh, we know very well what to do, but 19 was so far away. It was a different pathogen, you know, very different kind of circumstances. Same thing with, with medications. Uh, you know, it's, it's a question of um, what is the prior that you start with? Is it an optimistic prior? Is it a neutral? Is it, uh, is it, uh, is it pessimistic? Uh, uh, people will, will seek to have different levels of evidence, different amounts of evidence, before they can move to action. And uh, then there's many other aspects. There's like the acuity of the situation, the um, um, sense of other collateral harms or damages. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's not an easy and generalizable question. Um, probably each one of us is, is uh, a bit different in terms of 
how much evidence they want to see before they accept something for granted. You know, maybe I'm a slow burner in that regard. <laughs> I want a little bit more evidence um, than average. Uh, other people want less or, or no evidence. You know, the, 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 some people would say we, we need to just uh, do our best guess uh, and uh, heuristics are good or, you know, like prediction markets, for example, are going to be better than chance. Uh, it, it, it's 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 not something that I can answer in a in a generalizable way, but I do worry about rush evidence or non evidence based decisions about um, which in, in a way then lead us to a situation where we 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 then never get evidence because we we have already made decisions we have gone down a path and. Uh, that's too late then to, to have evidence. It's, it's even more difficult to make a case that you need to have evidence. So it's, um, I think it is a problem. And, and we see empirically that it is a problem because many drugs, for example, they're withdrawn or they have new black boxes being added. I mean, we know very little about them. Many of the accelerated approvals, typically in oncology, uh, they're made with the expectation that they will prolong life. They're based on non-survival outcomes, but the expectation is that they will prolong life and they do not. Then when we collect the evidence, we see that there's no prolongation of survival. There's a improvement on some surrogate outcomes, but not survival. So we have, ev we have evidence that, that these kind of rush decisions are not um, as sound as, as one would wish. Thank you very much. Next question is going to be by uh, Henny Hook, please. Um, yes. Uh, through this fascinating talk, I was struck by you, the fact that you, you did not mention the well-known statistical phenomenon of regression to the mean, which um, clearly must be at least part of the problem. And I'm, for those who may not be familiar with it, and it's generally the observation that if uh, you have both chance and deterministic effects con contributing to an outcome, then when you, uh, uh, let's just say, replicate a study to the extent that chance is contributed, uh, the effect you'll observe the next time will be lower. So one would expect to a large extent, I would think, and I wonder if you can measure this precisely, how much uh, regression to the mean would account for some of the failure of replication that you've illustrated in the uh, slides you showed? Well, regression to the mean is, is a substantial contributor to many of these issues. I didn't use the term, but uh, there's multiple empirical evaluations, some by my team, others by others, uh, looking at, uh, at its impact in, in real life uh, beyond what you expect in theory. And, and we do see that. We see that if, if you select based on a, a filter of significance, for example, and you're in a universe of, of small studies, then you expect to have very strong regression to the mean. Mm -hmm. if, if you are not selective uh, and or you have very large studies up front, then the impact is very small. And, and we, we, we do see empirically that what you expect by theory is really seen in the data. We've looked at uh, multiple thousands of meta-analysis in different fields and they they do show these patterns. In the PNAS paper that I showed with these 18 different patterns of bias, one of them is a decline effect pattern. And the decline effect pattern is pretty much the footprint that you expect from regression to the mean. You have a strong effect early on that then diminishes as you get uh, more evidence. It's very common in, in many fields. It accounts for a large uh, segment of the problem in these fields of having inflated effects. It doesn't mean necessarily that the effects are completely non-null. There, there may be some effect, but it's much smaller compared to what is originally being presented. And, and then the question is, if, if it's a curiosity effect, then it doesn't matter. But if it's a, an effect that you want to act upon, uh, mm -hmm. there's a threshold that if it's below a given threshold, then it doesn't really uh, translate to something that you, you would want to implement because there may be cost or, or adverse events or, or other things that make it uh, not really worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perry, uh, you're, you're next. Just one question, Perry. 
Mary, can you hear me or you, you're mute? All right. Um, Barry, I'm on okay, yeah, go for it, Barry. We can hear you. Okay, my, my point is, um, uh, my question is particularly about climatology, okay? Now, people are going around equating all kinds of disasters with uh, with climate, with changes in climate. And I spoke with uh, uh, a gentleman, uh, I won't say who, but he's, uh, he, he's a top person in climatology at the University of Pittsburgh. And what he told me was, the first question you ask is, look at the data, okay? And then look at, see how the person came up with the uncertainty in the data. Now, of course, this kind of mythology is propagated uh, throughout the uh, uh, th throughout the uh, uh, the media. Is is there any way that uh, you can and then? Uh, Barry, you we, we haven't heard the question. You stop at is there any way, which is actually just the wrong place to stop for a question. <laughs> uh, can you repeat your question, Perry? My my question is a lot of misinformation about climatic disasters is being published everywhere. Climatology is a very young science how can uh, is there any way to stop these people from doing it and discrediting the whole field so i'm i'm not a, a climatologist but uh, my reading of the field is that uh, actually it is a pretty reliable field and i i i think that the the main effects like there's climate change there's uh, uh, man-made climate change are pretty robust uh, why do I say that? I, I say that because um, it has tons of data uh, and it's pretty transparent. You know, these data are at least the, for the main derivatives of, of conclusions are, are widely shared uh, and they can be analyzed by different analysts. They, they can see if they get the same results and they pretty much get the same results. Of course, there may be some uncertainty about the exact magnitude of effects, but, uh, but that's kind of a second uh, level question. Now, in terms of, of generalizing and kind of extrapolating to uh, kind of secondary events and outcomes, I, I think that indeed becomes more problematic because uh, it, it doesn't have the same uh, level of documentation necessarily as uh, these high level uh, conclusions. Um, we, we just need more evidence. We, we just need more of these studies to be replicated uh, we have seen that pattern of um, expanding phenotypes in other fields, like in biomedical research. Statins are clearly an effective class of drugs. There, there's no doubt about it. I, I think that uh, they can save lives. Um, but then there's many other studies that are trying to associate statins with benefits in like a hundred other diseases beyond cardiovascular disease. And you know, many of these extrapolations are not necessarily uh, as sound or maybe not sound at all compared to the, the primary effects that, that have much better support uh, for the evidence. So it's, uh, it's a more generic problem uh, when you go from main effects to kind of secondary effects or extrapolations. I would argue you just need to test them very carefully and have extra validation for these additional effects. Thank you very much. Uh, Vera Dunenberg, you're uh, next and you probably you'll be up. Uh, yeah. go, go for it, Vera. All right, this isn't Vera, this is Albert. We logged in together. Um, <laughs> so we live in the world of small sample size experiments. We're cancer cell biologists and immunologists, we run a mom and pop laboratory, quite literally. Um, and the last paper that we submitted we were asked to include primary data. Um, and we're, there are other 
there are other journals that we submit to where it makes sense. But in this case, and it took a lot of work to organize. And at the end of organizing all of this primary data and putting it online um, with uh, supplementary data and explanations, I really felt that it was unlikely that anybody would benefit from this. It would, even if we took our laboratory notebooks and, and scanned every page, um, there's still so much that's missing. So my question is, if we are going to get past the small experiment problem and make results more reproducible, do we have to change the way we design and document our experiments? There, there are important questions in, in what you mentioned, and it's, it's multiple questions. I, I think it's an issue of, of um, uh, how documentation is happening for this type of laboratory work. I think that there's many ideas about how to automate documentation of, uh, of production of data and therefore making it more easy to share them or transfer them or, or do whatever uh, one wants to do with them. Uh, I think that I, I see that in many scientific fields many of the data sharing processes are not efficient. They, they take a lot of work. As you say, many of them will not be used by anyone. Uh, if, if you have to create a data sharing system from scratch, it's, it's a lot of effort. Uh, conversely, if you have some standardized stream, streamed uh, uh, path of data production documentation and then you know, making that available on a cloud for people to, to use it, it may be much easier. And some of that effort may need to be centralized. You know, some of that effort may need to be done at, let's say, NIH level or institutional level, rather than have each researcher try to, to reinvent the wheel for each experiment to mm -hmm. become available. Um, yeah, I, I think that that um, there's a there's a little bit of a danger in that also. And I have the other foot in the clinical world where I run a clinical laboratory that makes. Um, cellular products that go into people. And I can tell you that the way that we document things and also the way we develop new assays or new procedures is very different from the way that we do it in, the, in our basic research laboratory. And what it does is it really improves reproducibility. It really, um, the documentation is superb, but to make the smallest change is so difficult that if we adopted the same standards in our research lab, we would never get anything done. Making the smallest change requires overlap studies and validation and uh, bringing a new lot of uh, reagent into the laboratory requires overlap testing. And this is according to standards that are used um, in the pharmaceutical industry, which are standards that we follow. You can't really apply that to basic science without like killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Yeah. Uh, all of these research practices, they need to be seen in terms of the collateral damages that they can cause. So I, I, I would never argue to introduce something that would destroy the, the research process. This is not an effort to add an extra layer of, uh, of uh, unnecessary effort or bureaucracy or some extra workload that doesn't help. The, the, the basic question is, by introducing a change, are we making our life better as researchers? Are we, are we making our, our work uh, more efficient? Are we making it more credible? Uh, so efficiency is is critical. Uh, and I, I, I think that introducing changes that uh, are inefficient by default, they, they, they need to really achieve something else that is spectacular in order to say that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to su suggest that, that this is done. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Sandy, you will be next and uh, and last for, for, for today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that really absolutely covered pages of notes on your talk um, today. But as a, I wanted to end with at least a philosoph more philosophical question, and that has to do with um, one of the dangers, at least in the um, work that I looked at. So I've looked at, say, um, um, uh, knockout experiments, which are one of the sources for moving to GWAS, for example, is that... Um, there seems to be the message, one message one might take, and I think this would be not fair to you, but is that um, if you wanna get better understanding of what's going on, you need more data. And that the only way to uh, get more closer to the truth is to increase da uh, your data set, larger samples, larger samples. But there are, there are uh, it seems to me the advice on how to get better has to be contextualized more 
to the kind of phenomenon that's being studied, as well as the kinds of methodologies that are accessible. So if you think about, you know, uh, uh, de uh, cognitive de developmental studies on infants, no way you're going to get larger studies, right? Um, uh, as far as I can tell, it's very hard to do that. Okay, but at least it's not as easy if it's if, even if it's possible. And the the problems with knockout experiments is when the kinds of results that were expected weren't met. The 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 response was, well, we need to do more studies rather than what happened, which is we need to reconceptualize the phenomenon. So I'm a little nervous about the you know the larger and larger study, uh, more and more data being the being taken as what needs to happen, which then can lead to kind of perverse results. So can you say something a little bit more about the contextualization of that kind of advice? Uh, the, the ceiling of uh, what is the maximum sample size will vary tremendously from one question to another. Uh, some questions, they only have a sample size of one. I, I was talking with, uh, with students earlier today, and I said, if it's the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano, the the sample size is one. Uh, you cannot really repeat 1880, whenever it was that, that it erupted. Um, and in other cases, you may have a, a ceiling of just 10 observations. In other ceilings, you may have almost an endless ceiling of, of millions of observations being feasible with uh, relatively low cost and, and perhaps even with less cost compared to running a series of small studies. I, I, I have seen that very prominently in the COVID era, for example, where within just a few months, there's about 3,000 randomized trials that have been launched. It's, it's an amazing number. You know, we're talking about experiments that usually take many months, if not years, to be designed. And within months, there were 3,000, 2,800 something in my last look. We have a COVID evidence database that uh, uh, we're keeping alive. And um, the small trials just didn't tell us anything, <laughs> more or less. Uh, maybe I'm overgeneralizing. Uh, what we learned was mostly coming from Recovery, which was a large trial, which people would say, oh, that would take forever. It would take 30 years to uh, recruit and another 10 <laughs> years to, to give us. It, it gave us data within months, literally, while well, the small studies were getting nowhere. So with, with probably a more efficient and less effort, and, and uh, as you say, in, in that context, contextual framework, the large study cost less, was more efficient, could be done faster compared to doing the small studies. In other cases, that's not going to be feasible. It's, it, it, we will not have the possibility to have 10,000 observations. We'll just have 500 at the most. And one needs to think about the field, the question, the dynamics, the resources. How do you optimally use that? Usually, it's better to, to try to do larger studies, but it's not like a blanket statement. It, it's, mm -hmm. it needs to take into account what, what are we dealing with. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sandy, for uh, stepping in and ending on a more philosophical note. And uh, uh, with that uh, discussion, uh, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, John, again, for joining us today for this uh, really uh, amazing talk. And um, that brought in actually more people than we are used to, but from people from the med school here at Pitt. It was actually really wonderful to see uh, all of you. And uh, uh, we hope to see some of you in the coming weeks uh, at the center. John, uh, I suggest you uh, meet again in, in, in five minutes, if that's, if that's okay with you, with the other link, uh, with the fellows for a short, a short meeting again, if that's fine with you. All right. Thank you very much again for your, for your wonderful talk. And, and, and see you in a few minutes. See you soon. Bye.